great to have you folks here. Um, without further ado, and, and my uh, hearty thanks to Craig for taking the time to be with us this morning, and I will hand this over to Alan to officially introduce our speaker this morning, and again, welcome. Thanks, Vicky. I too welcome you all at this early hour. Very impressive. And uh, before I get started, I just want to thank BNY Mellon Wealth Management, uh, with special thanks to Jane Staunton, who's here. There she is, Jane, in the front row. Um, and to our friends of Concordia, whose generous support makes our community programs possible. And I also want to thank Martha Burgle and Trish Smith, who made the connections to our speaker today. So thanks to both of them. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest. Dr. Uh, Craig Smith is Roswell's very own. He's one of the nation's leading cardiac surgeons. He is chairman of the Department of Surgery at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and surgeon in chief at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center, and its Vivian and Seymour Milstein Family Heart Center. Praised by his peers as representing the best Columbia and New York Presby Presbyterian can offer for his excellence in training leaders in medicine, providing superb patient care and education, while driving innovation at NIT Columbia to keep it the most active and successful program in the nation. He has been recognized throughout his many leadership roles for fostering a culture of research and educational excellence with unprecedented clinical collaborations. His most recent research has been as co-principal investigator for the multi-center partner aortic transcatheter valve trial focused on treatment of patients for a high risk or not suitable open heart valve replacement surgery. An admired and respected leader in his field, I would add he is equally admired as a devoted husband, father, and friend. <coughs> Among his remarkable accomplishments, he repeatedly remarks his wife and three daughters, and now grandsons, are much more important to him than his professional achievements. A heart expert with a heart. And a generous <laughs> one. <laughs> and, a, and a generous one at that. And with that, I could please welcome Dr. Jackson. <laughs> Well, thank you for that overly kind introduction, and we'll see. I guess we have to switch? Okay. The uh, drum roll for the media to see whether they work or not. Okay, looks like they will. So, it's always something of a challenge to decide what to say, and if you're, if you're not hearing me, by the way, speak up, uh, to, what to say to an audience that's not my peers. So, what I've done is to put together two sort of formal discussions that hopefully won't take terribly long and leave most of the time for questions and answers and see where you want to go with it. And the first thing I'll talk about is much more sort of dry and clinical and has to do with something that was just alluded to, which is this new experience with non-surgical valve replacements, which is probably the most exciting thing that's happened in treatment of heart disease in the last 20 or 30 years. It's been, if you've read the newspapers, you've probably heard about it. So I'll dwell a little bit on that. And then, time allowing, I'll talk about one of the things that I'm almost always asked about when I'm speaking to an audience of peers, of non-peers, I should say, which is how does heart disease get missed all the time in people who should have it detected? And that has some interesting twists, I think, for this audience in particular sometimes, this kind of audience in particular. So as we're required to do, my only relevant disclosure in the first part of this discussion is that I am the surgical principal investigator of the partner trial. All I get for that is my expenses. I don't have stock in Edwards or anything else, so all very clean. Now, this is just a picture of the heart. I don't think I have a pointer, but th those are the four valves. The one at the top is the pulmonary valve. The one in the middle is the aortic valve. To the left is the mitral valve, and to the right is the tricuspid valve at the bottom. So for those of you who want to renew your, review your uh, cardiac anatomy, and what I'll talk about initially is the one right in the center, the aortic valve. You, if you look at it, you'll notice three leaflets, little flaps. Those are relatively normal looking leaflets. They're sort of thin and they move easily and close neatly against each other. So that's a normal aortic valve. Those are three abnormal aortic valves and are the target of the treatment that I'll talk about. And you can see in various, the one in the lower, your lower left is actually probably the best illustration. You see bulky calcium deposits on the leaflets. They're very stiff. It's easy to imagine they don't open very easily. When the heart gets in that state, it's working very hard to push that valve open to just to get blood to the body. And eventually it becomes a life-threatening, life-shortening condition. When people with a valve like that develop symptoms, they have about a 50% chance of living two years. So it's a lethal condition untreated. 
Good thing we have treatments for it. And the treatment you'll hear about is the one that's new. Now, uh, my apologies to the squeamish if there are any here. I thought it might be relevant to see what this new procedure replaces. So this is a real quick survey of, an aor of an a, a surgical aortic valve replacement. So we'll talk you through it. That's a connection to the heart-lung machine. You can see the heart beating there in the background. Previously, you saw the sternum being opened. That's the, the connection for the venous return to the pump. Now everything's in place, and this, this clamp that you see, the metal thing is occluding the aorta so that there's no blood flow to the heart. The heart stops, and we open the aorta, enlarge the opening with scissors, and in a second you'll see the valve. Now there's a valve that looks something like the ones we just showed you. Big piles of calcium deposit, opens very, with great difficulty. So cut out the leaflets, remove these big chunks of calcium that are in the way, and figure out what size it should be, and take the right size valve off the shelf, put these sutures around the, where the calcium and the valve leaflets used to be, and then put it through the, the what we call the sewing ring of the valve, and that'll be parachuted down those those uh, sutures in a second. I know this is all go by, going by pretty fast. And then just a bunch of knot tying. You can see through the valve underneath into the left ventricle and mitral valve. And as I said, a bunch of knot tying, which is something we do thousands and thousands of times every day. This is, the whole procedure takes about three hours. So you're seeing a three minute piece of a three hour operation. <clears throat> At this point, you're usually about an hour and a half into it. I just have to close the hole that we made in the aorta, which is an, a relatively simple surgical task. Just, it's like sewing a hem. <laughs> and then in a second, the clamp that's keeping blood from getting into the heart will be removed and you'll see the heart start to beat again and that pretty well can there are a thousand little steps that I've that I've omitted here that have a lot to do with the results but if this gives you the big picture now the blood flow has been restored to the heart so it will start beating in a second <coughs> these should have been edited out now the, this heart was fibrillating so we use the paddles to get it into a better rhythm which is true most of the time now it's beating, taking the pacing wires off, and off we go. So that's, that, is what, that is what the new procedure replaces. Now, that may look horrendously invasive and so forth, and I guess it, it really is, but it's also the gold standard for the treatment of that condition. Uh, it's been around for, yeah? How many people were working on that? I was the one whose hands you were seeing. I have an assistant across the table from me, a nurse to my right, two anesthesiologists, behind the scene are two perfusionists running the pump, and a circulating nurse, it's usually eight or nine people. So that is the gold standard, that's the treatment that's been around 25 or 30 years. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about how successful that is in most cases, and even today, even with the new treatments you'll hear about for the average person that's still by far the best way to go. And you'll get some understanding why that's true today. But this thing that we'll talk about now is very exciting and very promising. These are the two varieties of valve that, are, that we'll be talking about. On the left, or on the right, the Edward Sapien valve, which is the partner trial valve, the one that I'm involved with. On the other side is the core valve, which is made by Medtronic. Uh, a little later entry into the game, currently in a clinical trial, a couple of years behind Edwards in that respect. You can see they both have wire meshes of one sort or another that allow them to be collapsed onto a catheter so they can be inserted through some other portal than having to go through the chest, uh, which is the whole key to making these uh, non-open heart surgery. So the cartoons on either side show you the two ways to do this, and I have a longer cartoon that shows uh, the procedure a little bit more thoroughly, which is here. Of course, this doesn't look anything like any of our patients, but... <laughs> Um, in the cutaway, this is a, you can see a wire coming up through the aorta from a puncture in the groin. Uh, 
back around across the aortic valve into the left ventricle. The ventricle is that red thing that's squeezing. There's the valve. First step is to put a balloon across the valve and blow it open just to crack it a little bit to make it ready to accept the new valve. And leave the wire in place, pull that catheter out. And then a much larger catheter comes up over the, sh over the wire containing the valve. And it is quite large, which is one of the issues. And here comes the valve delivery device itself. The valve is this thing crimped just past the purple part. And that'll be put across the valve that's been prepared and blow it open. And that's all there is to it. Now, of course, there's a lot, a lot I don't tell you about this, but you'll, that you'll learn in a few minutes. A few things to notice, you know, the, big, big, at the upper right, you can see the big blood vessels that go off the aorta up to the brain, very nearby, potentially important issue. So some more views of how this is done. There's the valve in the upper left, the sheath that's used to insert it in the upper right, the catheter that guides it, and the way it's prepared in the operating room each day with a crimper, literally a crimper. You just take the thing, collapse it, and turn a wheel and crush it onto the uh, catheter. And here's a procedure actually being done, so we'll let this loop through a few times. On the right, you can see the fluoroscopic impression of what's actually going on. And on the left, you see an EKG tracing. So why do I show you those two things? Well, look at the EKG tracing for a second. You see that it's going along sort of normally here and then suddenly looks very abnormal. This is the blood pressure. You can see a nice normal blood pressure until this happens and then no blood pressure. And then it resumes. Well, we do that so that while we're trying to blow the balloon up in the valve or blow the new valve up in place, we don't have circulation pushing the balloon out. So. We can't have the heart working to eject blood while we're trying to put this thing in place or it'll get blown out into the circulation. So we have to stop the blood pressure. So that's done by pacing the heart at a very rapid rate. So we put pacing wires on it, pace the heart at 150 or 180 or something, and the blood pressure goes away. Then turn off the pacemaker, and usually it comes right back like that. And if it doesn't come right back, we shock it. So on the right, you see the valve at the moment. The heart is being rapidly paced, and in a second you'll see the and there's the balloon blowing up the valve in place. So that's the essence of it. This is back to where the thing has just been put in place, rapid pacing has just begun and so forth. So you've seen that several times. This is what it looks like when you're done. Dye injected in the aorta. You can see a nice competent valve, very little if anything leaking back across it. Now there are problems with this. As you could see, this is a very large device. And you can see that on the left, this has happened occasionally, that the, the iliac artery that this is being pushed through ruptures. And you can see on the right what, in that particular case, that looked like. This is the iliac artery stuck to the catheter. You can imagine that that wasn't easy to fix. In fact, it was fixed. It was not easy, but the patient survived and so forth. But that can be a very, very serious problem. And it has everything to do with the size of the device that's required to put this thing up into the heart. So that is one significant remaining limitation. An alternative is to put the device in through the tip of the heart. It's called the transapical approach. To do that, we have to make a small incision in the left chest, find the apex of the heart, put a purse string in it, as you can see illustrated, and then do things in the reverse direction. But it does avoid having to pass any of that big bulky stuff through the circulation and around the aortic arch. So some simple illustrations of that. And this is just It's essentially the same thing, but the device has been inserted through the tip of the heart. You can see the chest retractor sitting there. But same concept, same pacing and all the rest. And this is what that can look like when you're done. See a nice competent valve, very little of the dark color getting back across the valve. Now another thing that can happen is this. I know you don't know, don't know how to read echocardiograms and wouldn't expect you to, but if you look at the image in the center, you can see this little flame to the left. That shouldn't be there. That's blood that's leaking back across the valve or around the valve, actually. That shouldn't be there. Uh, how much can be tolerated is a matter of degree. Here's a much worse one. You can see the dye being injected in the aorta on your left and quickly filling the ventricle. So obviously much, much too much blood going in the wrong direction. And that's not a good thing. Heart doesn't tolerate that well. This particular patient died, and you can see why the, the valve didn't fit. And you just see a gap around the valve between that and the calcium. So that is something that 
uh, also needs attention as this technology develops. So that I'm being, uh, you know, non-partial, I'll mention this is the core valve that the Medtronic makes. A little bit different concept. It's made out of nitinol. Nitinol is an interesting metal, which, depending exactly how it's put together, is in one position at a colder temperature. When you put it at body temperature, it changes shape. So that's the trick with nitinol. You put it where it belongs. It warms up and expands. It has three different zones of tension that are all engineered in, and it's the lower narrow zone that sort of holds it in place. The upper flared part deals with the coronary blood flow and other technical issues. But it's just a different device, different way of doing exactly the same thing. A similar looking delivery system. The nitinol has the advantage of being a little bit smaller, so it starts out with a smaller delivery system. Now, this is a complicated slide I'm not going to tell you too much about, but if, if you start talking about how, is, how should this technology be implemented, well, an important comparison is to say how well does it do compared to the gold standard. And I showed you the gold standard, an open heart procedure. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is a summary of outcomes in the world's experience with this device, mostly in Europe, before we actually started the partner trial. So if you look at the far left column, which is death at 30 days, sort of standard procedural endpoint, you can see that the mortality went from 6 to 25 percent at 30 days. That's pretty high mortality. So, and if you look at stroke over to the right, 0 to 10 percent stroke rate with these in the world's experience prior to the partner trial. So that's a somewhat sobering experience that would make you hesitate to put this in place in everyone. Uh, so the challenge for the partner trial was to pick the right patient population. The choice was made to compare these devices to patients who were very high risk for surgery or to patients who couldn't have surgery. So that's, that was the basic idea. Now, for those of you who know how these games are played, this is where the name partner come from. Well, this is how, you know, there are people who are actually paid to spend hours coming up with these acronyms. Uh, and that's how they do it. But it's not, entirely, it's not entirely baseless. There was a reason for the partner concept, and it's actually one of the more part, important elements of this experience. Uh, prior to this, for the most part, cardiac surgeons and interventional cardiologists were, you know, in their separate silos, fighting over market share, you know, as tawdry as that sounds, that's how it tends to go, or did go. Uh, we needed a new approach to that to make something like this work. Interventional cardiologists knew essentially nothing about valve disease, knew a lot about coronary disease. Surgeons knew everything about valve disease, but not how to manipulate catheters, so there really had to be a coming together, which is what this is all about. I also have to mention that it was not me who made it. It was actually an interventional cardiologist who made this slide, so I can't be blamed for labeling it, labeling that part of it <laughs> that way. So the idea behind partner was uh, different rules of engagement. Briefly summarize the results of the trial. It was carried out at these sites. That's 25 sites in three countries, a little over 1,000 patients. The study design I alluded to a second ago, two arms that were independently powered. I'll, I will ask questions or answer questions if you have them about statistics, and I'll be glossing over the statistics pretty fast, I'm afraid. In the inoperable group on the right, where we'll start, 358 patients. Uh, this group had to be able to accept the catheter in an artery in the leg. So if they required the transapical approach that I showed you with the small incision, they were considered ineligible. So if they were capable of accepting the catheter in the leg, they were randomized one-to-one, -one, coin toss essentially, to either receive the new valve or receive nothing. So that was the inoperable group. And these were all very carefully screened surgeons with gatekeepers who decided that they were inoperable because the risk was just excessive. And what were the results in that group? That was a, a really dramatic benefit in favor of the new device in blue. The TAVI device is in blue. Uh, this may or may not impress you. The end point at 12 months with a difference of this magnitude, about 20 percentage points, and a p-value of 0 0.0001 is almost unprecedented in clinical trials. It's just about as big a benefit as you will ever see. Even bigger if you include repeat hospitalization and add it to mortality. So these people are not only living longer, they're not going back to the hospital as often as the people untreated. So a very dramatic benefit. Wasn't the whole story. If you look at some of the other outcomes, uh, this compares the experimental valve on the left to standard treatment in the column right next to it. You can see that for death, 
5% for TAVI and 2.8% for standard treatment. Of course, at 30 days, these people had a procedure. A few more of them died. That's not surprising. The concern was stroke. So if you look down to the middle highlighted in blue, about a five or six fold increase in stroke compared to doing nothing. Now again, the people who had standard treatment had nothing done, so you wouldn't necessarily expect them to have more than the normal background stroke rate. Uh, but it does tell you that there is some risk taken by putting this device in, in terms of neurologic events. And that remains one of the bigger uh, issues. Uh, vascular complications, again, v very much more common, like the video I showed you of the uh, ruptured iliac artery. Very much more common if you have the device and very uncommon if you don't, so not at all surprising. And these problems had complications, I mean, it had consequences, I should say, so that if you had a major vascular complication, it had a significant impact on mortality. So the yellow line shows the survival, or the mortality, rather, for those who had a complication, the blue line shows survival or mortality for those who didn't. Uh, same also true if there was major bleeding and even more striking for stroke. So if you were unfortunate enough to be in the 6% who had stroke, it had major impact on your survival. So it's an issue. Still far better than doing nothing on average. Uh, I showed you the picture of a valve that had a lot of leakage around it. Uh, it turns out this is the results from this part of the trial. If you look at the yellow and orange slices, uh, almost 60% of the patients, or about 60%, had mild or moderate leakage around the valve. That's not something you see in surgical valves. Is that important or not? We just, we really don't know. It's remained stable over a year. It's appearing to be much less important than we imagined it might be. So that's one of these uh, issues that will take some time to work out. That experience that I just showed you was published in the New England Journal with uh, Marty Leon as the first author last fall. Now the high risk surgical cohort, about 700 patients, uh, first looked at with respect to whether or not they could have a catheter inserted through the groin versus inserted through the tip of the heart. And the, the main action was in those who could have it inserted through the groin, but in whichever group they fell into, they were then randomized one to one, in other words, it's a coin toss, against the new device versus the gold standard surgical procedure that I showed you in the video. So this was the more interesting randomization, gold standard versus new device. What do these patients look like uh, tells you a lot about the selection process. Very old, average 84 years or so. Uh, this STS score that's highlighted, you wouldn't know a thing about, but it's a risk measurement, and that's a very high risk. This, to get to this level, you're in the top 4 or 5% of the experience of valve replacement. So this is very high risk. The NYHA class 3 or 4 tells you about symptoms, so very symptomatic, 94% in the highest symptomatic class. So a sick group with a variety of other problems that I won't dwell on, but a group of very sick patients. So what did it look like? Well, the official endpoint was mortality at one year, and that's what you see for surgery in the yellow line. So 12 months, 27% mortality at one year. Very sick population, not surprising. For the device in blue, about the same. You can see there's sort of a separation in the curves early, which is very encouraging, suggesting that the early impact is less if you don't have open heart surgery, which wouldn't surprise anyone necessarily. So in terms of how this is analyzed statistically, and I, I hate to drag you through this, you know, the question posed to the, the FDA posed was not was this new device superior to aortic valve replacement done surgically, but is, is it equal to, which is statistically a non-inferiority test. So there's a whole different methodology that's applied to that, which I'll drag you through here. Here was the difference in the two endpoints at one year, 2.6%. Uh, the upper one-sided 95% confidence interval on that difference takes you up to 3%. There's a pre-specified margin of 7.5%. This is something that's worked out over months of battles with the FDA. What will that margin be and so forth? So you just plot the red against that pre-specified margin and you see that you fall very nicely within the pre-specified margin, so the primary endpoint is met. And this is now statistically non-inferior. So a lot of words just to say that this shows that the surgery, this new procedure was essentially equivalent to surgery with respect to survival at one year. There remain questions though. Uh, this, this shows you mortality at 30 days. So again, a procedural endpoint. How many people are alive early on? And you can see it, it tips 
very much in the direction of benefiting the, the, the uh, transcatheter valve. Uh, the p-value is almost below 0.05, it's 0.07, so 3.4% versus 6.5%. You know, that's pretty suggestive that the transcatheter valve might be better. However, the other issues that, we, that we'd seen in other uh, versions of this also show up, more bleeding, vascular injuries and so on with the catheter valve, but more importantly with stroke and other neurologic events, about double the frequency of neurologic events with the transcatheter valve as opposed to conventional surgery. So still a concern. Low frequency, you know, 5%, 4%, not a big number, but still a concern and about double the rate with surgery. Now, an important question in clinical trials, again, a digression I hope doesn't put you all to sleep, is to ask whether or not the control group was high enough quality. If you think about it, if you're comparing one treatment to another, you can make the new treatment look very good if you have sloppy execution of the control group, right? So if performance is poor in the control operation, in this case, if the surgeons doing the, AV, the surgical AVRs did a poor job, well, you could create a positive finding without intending to. So an important question in this kind of thing becomes, uh, how did the surgeons perform? So step two in this digression. The risk number that I showed you on the table before, which was 11.8%, high risk represents high risk. That's an estimate of the 30-day mortality. So if we accept that that was an accurate estimate of the risk for that population of 300 and some patients, how did they actually do? Well, the observed mortality was 8%. So 8 over 11.8 .8 is, an, is an observed to expected ratio of 0.68, which tells you it was much better than expected. So it answers that question to a first approximation. The performance in the surgical part of this trial was excellent. So any benefit that you see in the transcatheter valve is probably attributable to the quality of the procedure, not to some glitch in the control group. <coughs> Some other things worth noting that go along with what you might expect. This is the functional class at various time points. This is a measurement of symptoms, quality of life, all mixed together. And if you look at the 30-day bars, which are one to the right, you see that there's actually a significant benefit favoring the TAVR versus AVR at 30 days. The benefit disappears by six months and one year. So the surgical patients catch up, but at 30 days, early endpoints, benefit for the transcatheter valve. Wouldn't surprise you, a simpler procedure. And the same is true in a thing called the six minute walk, which is literally a six minute walk, uh, a functional yardstick. And you can see the same significant benefit at 30 days disappears at six months and one year, but an early advantage to the TAVR procedure. And the leakage around the valve remains a question. This compares the surgical to the non-surgical and uh, you can, without dwelling on all the different colors, you can see there's a significant difference at each time point with much more regurgitation in the transcatheter valve, very little in the surgical valve, but whether this is important or not remains to be seen, and it may turn out to be relatively unimportant. That experience was published in June uh, in the New England Journal as well. So where we are with this, I'd say, is we're just really just leaving base camp, and there's a lot to come, and I won't dwell on this. If you have questions about where we're going next, I can tell you about the trials that are now planned. Uh, it, the indication for patients who can't have surgery was recently approved by the FDA about three weeks ago. So if you are a person who meets the definition used in the trial of inoperability, well then you can have the device used commercially now. So that's the first approval for this in the US. Uh, Further approvals will be coming down the line in the next year, presumably, for high-risk patients. And then the big question is, how far do we go with lowering the risk threshold? You can see from the results I just showed you that uh, the TAVR device looked pretty good against surgery at 30-day mortality. Uh, you'd think we should probably drop down the risk spectrum a bit from what the trial was conducted in, and that will probably happen. But it'll probably be quite a while before this is being done in the average member of this audience, for example. Uh, you know, you're just all I can tell looking at, you're all too healthy, uh, at least <laughs> right now. Uh, that's probably true. What'll be true in four or five years when we're not all so healthy? Uh, don't know, we'll have to see. Uh, delivery systems are getting smaller. 
they're now down to 18 French. This is a measurement of diameter. And they will continue to get small. 24 French is about the size of your finger. That's big. 18 is getting closer to your little finger. As, it, as they get smaller, it will get safer. And just so I'm being ecumenical, I'll mention that the Medtronic core valve trial is underway. They're a couple of years behind in the enrollment process, so their results will be coming along a little later. So maybe what I could do, if you want, I could stop here and ask and take questions about this part, and then if there's time left, I can talk about detection of heart disease or not, as you see fit. Do you want me to just keep, yeah? What type of metal is used in those valves so you avoid uh, rejection by the body? Well, the metal is not a rejection issue because most metals are inert enough not to have rejection. The leaflet material is not really a rejection issue. It's more a durability issue. The Medtronic valve is porcine, so it's, the leaflets are sculpted out of the pericardium of pig. The Edwards valve is bovine, so it's the pericardium of a cow sculpted into leaflets. A couple of the other valves are equine, believe it or not, so horse pericardium. So some animal or other sacrifices its pericardium to make the leaflets. The, the, the metals depend more on what, how they want. So nitinol is a particular metal. Uh, I think the, as far as I recall, the, uh, uh, the Edwards valve is mostly stainless steel, but there could be other allies in there, alloys in there that I don't know about. Yeah, Frank, um, <clears throat> what you've talked about here all relates to the studies that you've done here. Um, maybe you could spend a minute and back up and give us a little history. This is uh, what the procedure goes back up a little ways, at least in the rest of the world. In the end, our year was a, 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 presumably that had trials of their own, and I'm wondering uh, well, what the evidence, how the evidence compares to what you know. The first in man procedure was about 10 years ago in France. Just, you know, because you can, you can do pretty much what you want in Europe a lot of the time. So, um, and that is where a lot of the early experience was. And most of the experience I showed you in that large table was from Europe over the last decade. It didn't really get done in any large numbers until maybe 2006, 2007, somewhere along there. And then the experience in Europe did start to take off. They, they reached what they call CE mark, which is approval in Europe, essentially, three years ago, maybe and then it took off some more. So there have been quite a few of these done in Europe. Uh, there had never been a randomized trial before a partner. In fact, truth is there had never been a randomized trial on this scale, this carefully executed in valve, in the treatment of valve disease ever. It's very expensive to do, very difficult to do. So, but an important enough question, people wanted to see it done. So, uh, you're gonna have to leave me alone for a while. Uh, the experience in Europe showed the early experience, and, and in the U.S. in the feasibility phase trials, less good results than you saw here. So the partner experience is the best in the world. Uh, presumably the rest of the world will catch up. Uh, but the larger experience is still in Europe and may remain there for a while. The U.S. The, the US FDA is not ready to release this into just widespread use. Interestingly, even in Europe, where it is essentially, they can essentially do what they want, uh, they are still using it primarily in high-risk patients. And it is not down into the more average risk population. Just for perspective, the, the patients that were trialed here, the high-risk patients, as I alluded to, are less than 5% of the surgical population getting aortic valve replacement. So that's not lots of patients in the big picture. And in Europe, they've come down the risk threshold to a point where they're treating maybe 25%, maybe 30% of patients who need valve replacement with this. So it's marched down quite a bit, but it's not, it doesn't have complete penetration yet. They probably will someday, but not yet. Yeah? Is that 5% number, is that likely to be a, a survivor, that number? Uh, the 5% I just mentioned is the percentage of patients who who have received aortic valve replacement surgically. Right. Is that likely to continue uh, or go down? Well, actually, that's a fairly subtle question because that, uh, that might shift as patients are removed from that part of the spectrum and treated with this valve, if that's what you're getting at. Um, so I'm, I'm probably not making it clear what that 5% refers to. Uh, if you, 
so let me try again. If you, so you're saying five percent yeah. is high risk. Five percent is are people who've had a risk expe expectation similar to the patients enrolled in the partner trial. So if you looked at the entire experience with aortic valve replacement of the type I showed you in the video, less than five percent would fall into a risk category of that 11, 12 percent mortality expectation at 30 days. So that's, that's considered very high risk. Will that shift is actually a very subtle question, and it, it probably will shift because patients in that risk group will be removed and treated with this, with the new valve. So the whole population will shift towards a lower risk mean. Uh, but I'm not sure that's what you're getting at. Well, that's okay. And, and are the two valves in Medtronic and yours, are they both about as far along with the FDA as, as one yeah. another? The Medtronic valve is not nearly as far along with the FDA, but it's every bit as far along in Europe. And it's actually a little bit easier for cardiologists to use because it was a little bit smaller to begin with. So it's probably a little more than half the experience in Europe right now is the Medtronic valve. Yeah. How does the interaction work between the surgeons sort of using the device and then the people at the company who are adjusting the device and actually those are physically creating it? And I'm partly wondering, in other words, I assume they, you can give them feedback and, and they can make adjustments, but does then that interfere if you're sort of midway in a trial? Does it compromise the results? You know, if you adjust the device or improve it. In the also very, uh, in a way, subtle question. If, if you're talking about what actually happens in the operating room, that's one issue. I'm not sure that's where you were focused, but there is, in a trial like this, there is a company person there crimping the valve and making sure that the technical parts of it are done correctly and kind of monitoring the situation, keeping track of the data. But also in the larger picture, as the trial goes on, there are definitely adjustments that have to be made. And, and you, know, you, you take a step back, figure out what could be done better, and so on. And it presents a conundrum to any trial, is how do you maintain the sanctity of the original design if you're making design changes along the way? How do you know what you're actually testing? Well, there was relatively little change in this over the couple of years it took to enroll patients. There was a change that much was made of in Wall Street and so forth early on in the endpoints, this gets very esoteric, but the endpoints that were chosen for assessment of the trial, there was a change made about three months in uh, that, that many people on Wall Street chose to view as very sinister, but it was really just, this is the longer story behind it, just a simple adjustment in trial design. And there are adjustments like that that have to go on. And it's a joint process. It's company, and it's investigators. It's, it's a two-way street for sure. I'd say it's driven more by the investigators by and large. I should mention, by the way, because somebody asked the Medtronic versus, uh, you know, the, the core valve versus Edwards valve question. You're probably wondering if it's done all the time in Europe and it's a little smaller and simpler, why isn't it done all the time everywhere? The problem with that valve has been its own issues, and one of those issues is 20% or so end up needing a pacemaker, probably because of that big skirt pressing against the part of the heart that has the conducting system. So it has its own set of issues. Yeah. Yes, so uh, we hear a lot about health care costs rising and all. As this procedure continues, as you get more experience, do you uh, see it getting less costly? Uh, will it be? Uh, great question. And everybody would love to say yes. Uh, right now, the cost of the valve is exorbitant. It's going to be $30,000 per valve. and that's six times what a surgical valve costs. Of course, all the R&D is being built into that price. The procedure itself, this has been studied actually, and if you look at the comparison of patients who don't have anything done to patients who have this procedure done, well, the patients who have the procedure save money on rehospitalizations over a year, but it's not enough, at least not yet, to make up for the cost of the procedure. So there's still about a $25,000 difference at a year against the new procedure. So as time goes on, experience improves, length of stay reduces, so that may disappear. Uh, compared to surgery, because of the cost of the valve, it's an even more difficult comparison. Surgery is in itself expensive, so those almost cancel out. Surgery, patients tend to stay a little longer in the hospital, so that's a plus for TAVR. The thing we don't know is whether there will be more repeat procedures over a few years, as there have been with stents in the coronaries, which would cancel out any cost savings. So important question, time will tell.
Yeah. Is there I, any difference in um, prophylactic medications that would differ from the um, artificial valve versus, of course, some of the um, surgical valve? Yeah, there is. Uh, because of that concern about stroke, we, uh, even though it, it, we don't completely understand where it all comes from, whether it all comes from the procedure or subsequent to the procedure, to be on the safe side, everybody is put on Plavix for at least six months, frequently longer, Plavix or other potent antiplatelet agents. And that will probably continue. That's being done in Europe. They have a variety of cocktails in Europe that they're using, and that will probably continue. That is not required for surgical valves. Surgical valves of the porcine bovine, so on variety, don't require much of anything. Somebody else had a hand up. Yeah. I think you said that if you're relatively younger and otherwise healthy, the traditional more invasive procedure is still better because it's, it involves less complications. Was your sample size large enough to compare the results among a, a group of patients who are relatively younger and healthier as opposed to older people? And can you say the, the, the complications are significantly less in the older <coughs> group? Excellent question, and there are sort of two parts to it. Uh, one sort of sample size, the easiest part to answer is sample size. Was this sample large enough to show meaningful differences in relatively low frequency events? Well, no, and it wasn't designed to. If stroke occurs 1.7% of the time in open hearts in this, as we saw in this surgical population, stroke occurred about 2%, let's say, of the time. That's a low frequency event. You'd have to have a trial of, you know, five, 10,000 patients to really show big differences there with high statistical significance. Uh, maybe not 10,000, probably 5,000 patients. So that's one question. The sample size was not there. So what does that tell you about that risk? Well, it, it, you still have the fact that in a sample size that wasn't enough to show you a difference, you still found a significant difference for all neurologic events. So that's a little concerning. And the minute you break down all neurologic events into stroke, minor stroke and so forth, well, you're going to quickly fall below the statistical threshold and it'll be statistically non-significant. But it's a signal, as the FDA likes to say, that persisted through every analysis. So it remains a concern. Now, would it, the second part of your question, would it be a concern in younger patients? Well, great question. We just don't know. And we won't know until it works its way down into younger patients. But presumably the stroke risk in both groups will also be dropping because many of the features of stroke risk are age and illness related more than procedure related. So we don't know. So time will tell. Yeah. Are you tracking beyond the one year point, the two comparative groups to see what happens? Oh, for sure. Uh, the partner trial data now is approaching three years. Uh, the two year results were just presented a few weeks ago. Uh, no alarming new developments, basically. Things that we were didn't know where to worry about the leakage around the valves, for example, that two and three years so far doesn't appear to have much impact. Mortality continues to occur. It's a very old population, you know, people in their 80s. So far at the two and three year time points, no big surprises. The FDA will require that these patients be followed for at least five years, it appears. They're taking the, probably the strictest view that has ever been taken by the FDA of post, what they call post-market surveillance for this trial. You mentioned the incidence of rupture in the delivery of the uh, device uh, to the heart, um, sort of the shrinking of it will improve that, but I think I remember reading about the use of magnets to essentially pull things through the artery uh, as a less of a, a, a problem in that regard. Uh, there, is, there are a couple of things that are, that, yeah, you're right, there are things that are being worked on that use magnets to guide a magnet inside the ventricle that guides the catheter. There are, uh, and those may be one of the little incremental developments that helps. Basically, it's a challenge in miniaturization and has more to do with the valve itself because there's only so much you can take that thing that has to expand into a, you know, two and a half centimeter circle. There's only so much you can miniaturize that. And it has to do with the metals and the leaflet material and so forth. That probably can only be so small. And then the other details probably will help reduce vascular complications, but you'll still be left with something that's fairly sizable. What's yeah. the youngest patient you've 
you've attempted to place this? The uh, youngest or the oldest? The youngest. The youngest. Probably in their 50s. I don't know exactly. Probably in the 50s. They were pretty rare in the younger age groups, and it was in that category. It was usually someone who'd had uh, well, common, common but uncommon example patients who'd had massive radiation for Hodgkin's disease when they were in their 20s or something back in the 1970s or so, when that was very damaging and produces lots of heart damage and lots of damage to the chest wall, to the vessels and so on, so that operation is a real challenge. So many of those patients were considered inoperable and were treated in this category, but in total numbers there weren't very many of them. It's just, uh, yeah. In your high risk group of say 5% uh, at the average age, I think about 84, is that a normal healthy 84 or is that a 84 that has other problems and and therefore, you wouldn't use this on a healthy 84. Also a good question that I probably didn't make clear. Uh, that's a very unhealthy 84. And that risk score that I've mentioned, to get you up to 11.8% average, you have to have a lot more than an age of 80. <clears throat> the risk score for being in the 80s gives you about 2.2%, something like that. So you have, you have to have several other things about you, kidney failure, bad lungs, that kind of thing to get up into that risk group. So it is an unhealthy population of 80-year-olds. And right now, most 80-year-olds are still treated with the, you know, majorly invasive procedure I showed you. Because they're too healthy at the moment to, be, to justify treatment with this device. Well, that, I'm sure, will change. There's already clamor, you know, for, because people hear about this, they you know, read about it in the paper and they want to be treated that way. That, that must be the way to go. Well, I'm sure it will become the way to go, but it isn't yet, so at least not for everyone. Tell us how it's been. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, let me, uh, if they'll leave me alone for a minute, I can go through this probably pretty quickly. Um, again, I'll try to save you the statistics. The question I'm almost always asked is how could say President Clinton who always comes up in the discussion, how could his heart disease be missed? You know, how could people not know? He, you know, he just had a stress test two weeks before or something of that sort. So that question always comes up. And the answer is, there are a lot of reasons. So how do these, how do these things get missed? Well, symptoms are variable, as you know. you know. Not everybody has symptoms. So that's another big reason. Denial is a very big reason. People don't want to admit that they have symptoms. President Clinton being a good example, they put up with it for six months or a year, just don't want to admit it's going on. Very important factor. We don't educate patients as well as they need to be. This is probably a pretty sophisticated group that wouldn't just not even know to worry if they're having chest pain or something of that sort. Uh, but patient education and access to health care closely related to that. Uh, in, in the populations in the city, you know, a lot of patients just don't have a chance to get good health care. As you know, that's a social question. Uh, but a, a more subtle question is the accuracy of screening tests. And here's where I have sort of one point to deliver that I'll try to deliver efficiently. Uh, and that has to do with, again, some statistical concepts that may be familiar to you. Sensitivity and specificity, very important concepts. Uh, sensitivity takes all the false negatives, in other words, the tests that miss the problem, and puts them in the denominator. So the more of those you pile in the denominator, the lower the sensitivity. So it's, you, you can see why they call it sensitivity. Specificity is a little different. It takes all the false positives, which is the times the test inaccurately suggests there's disease, piles those into the denominator, and that number will go down. So the specificity, if there are lots of false, false positives, go down. So those are two very important sort of underlying concepts to what I'll get to. But those are not enough, and here's the real key. Those two issues are not enough to explain the accuracy of screening tests because the frequency of false positives is inversely related to the probability of disease. What does that mean? That means that uh, if you screen a low-risk population, you will get lots of false positives. That's what that means. So it's a good reason not to screen everybody. It introduces another concept that is useful to clinicians the positive predictive value, negative predictive value, focus mostly on the PPV. This is a little different twist. You take the false positives and put those in the denominator. So now you're taking a little different look at it. And adding all those false positives will reduce the positive predictive value. 
Now, the, the best example for this is HIV testing. It happens to be an excellent test. So if you look in the column on the left, the sensitivity and specificity for HIV testing happened to be extremely good. One in a thousand chance of a false negative or a false positive in both, um, on both sides. So very good test. If you go down to the bottom and look at a high-risk population, the IVDA, the, dr the drug abuse population, the prevalence, 10%. So one out of 10 have the condition. There, testing in that population, you can see that the, pos the positive predictive value is almost 100%. But if you go down to the normals, and the normals have some of those IVDAs and so on mixed in, the prevalence drops to 1%, but the positive predictive value only gets to 90%. The real issue is in something like the donor pool. Now, the donor pool, the prevalence drops another tenfold because you've had a lot of the, the obvious categories removed from the normal population. So that drops the risk tenfold. So you're dealing with a very low frequency of disease. And so what happens in that case, if you look at the footnote at the bottom, in that pool, if you test a million people, you'll have 999 false positives and 999 false negatives. So you'll have 1,000 people testing false positive, and that's not a good thing to do. So this is also applies to other screening tests, EKGs, stress tests, nuclear tests, so forth, and they turn out to have relatively poor positive predictive value. So if you come back to what the point I was trying to make, if you apply those in low, in low risk populations, you'll get lots of false positives. A great example, since we don't have lots of time, is, is a calcium scanning, very popular today. Calcium scanning is very, very sensitive. It's a very high sensitivity, relatively low specificity. So its positive predictive value is, is poor in a low risk population. If, we, if you did calcium scanning, calcium CT <coughs> scans on, you know, a million 30-year-olds, you'd probably get quite a few positives. But they're almost all false positives. So that's a waste of time, a waste of money, and a waste of radiation to the patients. Uh, you did the same thing in a population of 80-year-olds, like the patients of the partner trial, it's going to have a whole different picture because they're going to be relatively high risk, relatively few false positives. So the accuracy of testing has everything to do with the population you test. So the answer to why people get their heart disease missed is not to, to screen the population with stress tests. It's to think through the process, who should have a stress test? Symptoms, family history, age, all those things. So screening, per se, is often a waste of time and money. Now, the, the thing that uh, I will try to mention, I gave this talk a few years ago to a group in Greenwich, which specifically wanted me to talk about the VIP. So I will mention that, and of course they would, right? Uh, so, I, so I added to this list that one of the things that uh, hinders detection of heart disease is the treatment of the VIP. It's the induction of bad judgment. Uh, how does that occur? Well, there's a spectrum of bad judgments induced at both ends, both in the physician at one end and in the patient at the other end. For the physician, there's a, definitely an amplified fear of failure. The results are very visible, which also has to do with the fear of failure. And for both those factors, there are, there are physicians who care more about the fact they're taking care of high-profile patients than they may care about anything else. And that's not a way to induce good judgment. Uh, sort of affecting both ends are the denial enablers who surround you, particularly the patient. Uh, very important patients are surrounded by doctors who want to tell them only what they want to hear and by handlers who want to tell them only what they want to hear and they all enable denial. So not healthy. As you get closer to the patient issues, one of the biggest is difficulty surrendering command. Uh, I'm sure you can all relate to that. You really do need to, in the doctor-patient relationship, there has to be you know, some surrender of autonomy by the patient at some point and this can be a real tussle sometimes. Uh, but the smartest VIPs get that real fast. In fact, I would say President Clinton got this right away. He was absolutely great at that. And then related as well to the denial, just too many cooks often, you know, too many doctors all trying to have an opinion for their shot at the, you know. My most depressing example of this with the Clinton affair, in fact, was uh, the day, a couple days before we actually operated on him, one of the cardiologists whose career is built on using stents was uh, incensed that he wasn't being included as part of the team and, and his statement was, I deserve a crack at him. <laughs>
<laughs> and I thought, I thought that pretty well sums it up. Uh, anyway, that's a very big source of uh, bad judgment. So that's all I had to say, and I, I, we can take a few minutes. I have to get out of here pretty soon. But, uh, in the last several years anyway, the detection tests have all been basically the same. Are there any new ones coming down the pipe in terms of stress tests and nuclear and other ones? Uh, I'm probably the wrong person to answer the question in terms of the really new testing modalities, but by and large, over 20 years or so, there hasn't been a lot that's replaced the real basics. And the basic risk factors and so on remain the basic risk factors. And things like serum CRP and a variety of other serum tests and for trace metals and what have you may identify a few people at risk in some circumstances, but it m mostly comes down to the big issues. Cholesterol, weight, exercise, blood pressure, family history, those things. Uh, they account for like 99% of the risk. And if you use those things in deciding which tests to apply, the accuracy of the tests goes way up for the reasons I mentioned. So less important than maybe the, whether there's a really exotic new screening test is to think through the process of who to apply the test to. Well, I thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>